live the life with Dishan Vikramaratna. Someone said the value of life is not in its duration but in its donation. You are not important because of how long you live. You are important because of how effectively you live. The world uses a very narrow array of criteria such as wealth, fame, position to distinguish a life well lived from a life that was wasted. How do you know that you are not wasting your precious life whether you have all of that or not? Today, listen to Pastor Dishan Vikramaratna as he speaks on Don't Waste Your Life. And I've titled this message, Don't Waste Your Life. Don't waste your life. God has a specific plan for you. There is only one of you. There will never be another of you. So don't waste your life. Don't let anybody try to waste your life. Don't let the enemy waste your life. We're going to read Ephesians 5, 15 to 17. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. So it says, be careful how you live. The opposite of careful is what? Careless. So the word of God is saying, don't be careless how you live. You know, in Sinhalese, when I preach, I say, what God's word is saying, don't be careless. Don't just, you know, go atavana vana. I don't know where. There is intentional living that God has for each one of you. And God wants us not to live a careless life. Don't act thoughtlessly. That's what it says here. Right? You know your purpose. God has a plan for you. Be wise and make the most of every opportunity. And then finally it says, try to understand what God wants you to do. If I would ask you to be honest this morning, how many of you would say you would really want to know what God wants of you? If I tell you to raise your hands, I know all of you will raise your hands. Because everybody wants to really know what God wants. Well, I have good news for you. Because starting in two weeks, we are going to look intentionally in the next, in the 40 days starting in two weeks about what God wants you to do, what God wants me to do, why God created you, why he created me. And it's going to be a great journey together. But uh, before we, we do that, this week, I just want us to focus on three important questions. The first question I want us to quickly look at is, what does God want? What does God want from me? What does God want from you? What does God want? If you read through the whole Bible, you can actually summarize these uh, in, in three words. Right? It, it's very easy. Because if you look through, you will see that God wants, the answer to what God wants, my whole life. Fill in the answer there. My whole life. God wants my whole life. God wants my entire life. There is not one single verse in the Bible that says God will only take this part of your life. That part is for your friends. That part is for your work. That part you can do with some of these people who really don't know that you go to church. And no, God wants everything. He wants your whole life. He doesn't want 10% of your life. We give 10% of everything God gives us. But he wants our whole life. He doesn't want 10%. He doesn't want 50%. He doesn't even want 99%. What does God want? He wants my entire life. He wants all of you. And I'll tell you, there is no mystery in this. It's very clear. Let's look at Romans 6.13. Romans 6.13 says this. Give yourselves completely to God since you have been given new life and use your whole body as a tool to do what is right for the glory of God. Give yourselves completely to God. C.S. Lewis, the great author, said this, The only thing that Christianity cannot be is to be moderately important. The only thing that Christianity cannot be 
is to be moderately important how important are the things of god in your life what place does god really have in our lives so we need to give it all it's either all or nothing with god there is no you know i'll give this part god come and bless me god i have to do all these things you know I, like i always say sometimes the way we pray looks like we created god for us god do this god take care of that god tomorrow's meeting god the in law situation god this god that i you know sometimes i tell you take the word god out and put banda in there it's like saying you know do this banda do that banda go here banda come now if you banda please forgive me i'm not trying to demean the main banda i'm just trying to say it's like using somebody who works for us and we we use god like that did i create god for me so i can get up in the morning and give god all my all his instructions or did god create me for him You see God comes in and says listen I will do what I need to do because I love you I created you I have a plan for you but from your part I want your entire life I want to tell you there are a lot of people still you sit are sitting on the fence one leg for God one leg for the world and we can't be sitting on the fence well I don't know what God really wants me to do pastor Look at the next verse Deuteronomy 10:12 Deuteronomy 10:12 This is what the Lord your God wants you to do Respect the Lord and do what he has told you to do Love him serve the Lord your God with your whole being What does God want me you and me to do serve him with your whole being You know I want to tell you don't sit on the fence Some say you know well I'll serve God in my spare time You know we think God uh, this life is like a pie or like a pizza right in a pizza you know how you cut it and you get all these different slices so we have a slice for my social life we have a slice for my career we have a slice for my uh, sex life we have a slice for my family life we have a slice for my uh, uh, friends we have a slice then for God and my spiritual life no it does not work like that God wants the whole pizza. He wants to be control of all of my life. I want to tell you God comes at comes in one way. He comes in for all or he comes in for nothing. He doesn't come for part. There is a myth that you can do it all, you can have it all, but I want to tell you you can't do it all, you can't have it all. You have to give it all to God. Let's read Matthew 6:24. Now this one we're going to read loud together. Please take your paper to your hand. Please and let's read it together. Are you ready? Matthew 6:24. No, no one, one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now have you noticed it doesn't say here you should not serve god and money you should not serve two masters it doesn't say you should not you know what it says what does it say you cannot it is impossible you cannot serve god and money you cannot serve god and your career you cannot serve god and your family you cannot serve god and your friends you cannot put two things in first place if one thing gets into first place all the other things are second third fourth fifth and 25th you can't take two things and put it up there it's not just money it's whatever you put your education your love life your family whatever pushes god out of first place you know whoever takes first place in your life God calls that an idol. An idol worship is wrong. Oh you're saying no pastor I always tell God that he is first. God is not too worried about what you're saying. He's worried about what you're doing. If you want to see who is really first, look at where most of your time goes to. Look at where most of your money goes to. Look at where most of your thinking goes to. Look at where and what 
is first really in your life and you will find out that sometimes you say it's God but it's an idol it's your children sometimes that take that place and uh, you know i i remember the story and i hope you remember also about the 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 young man who follow, came came after jesus he came after jesus and jesus said follow me follow me and you know what the man said he said okay he said lord but lord let me first go and tell my relatives let me first go and bury my father you know there's a contradiction you can't say lord and say let me first it doesn't go together do you understand what i'm saying you can't say lord but let me first let me first do this let me educate my children let me some of you i want to tell you god has definitely called you called you to serve him up to today you're not serving him why because you're saying but let me first let me first and lord cannot be in the same sentence because it's contradictory lord if the lord is around let me first cannot be around if you are saying let me first the lord cannot be around so you, have you decided to go all or nothing that's how god works don't fool yourself don't deceive that you can turn god on and turn him off you know god is loving god is kind god is merciful god is beautiful god is wonderful but god is still god how about a good amen god is still god god is not some simaya who will come in when we want him to and we turn him and say okay now do this now bless me now no god is god and god wants his rightful place and god's rightful place is one there is no other place for god you can fool yourself by thinking you put in god when you want and he blesses you he does a miracle that's his graciousness that's his kindness that's his faithfulness his mercy but don't play with the mercy of god you know this is what god is saying your mortgage mustn't come before me your debt mustn't come before me your children mustn't come before me this is god is saying if i don't come first in your life i don't come at all Matthew 6:33 a verse that we know so well let's read it seek the kingdom of god above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need seek the kingdom first seek the righteousness of god first live righteously and he will give you everything i don't know anybody today here who does not want to be successful I know everybody wants to be a success. The Bible says if you want to be a success, put God in the right place in your life. If you put God in the right place, everything falls into place. <clears throat> Any time you sit on the fence, you lose. When you hand over entirely to God, you win. Let's look at the second question. So the first question is that the first question we ask is what does god want from me he wants my entire life the second question is what does it take what does it take to not waste my life what does it take to be what become what god wants me to be what does it take to develop myself into uh, becoming exactly what god ordained me to be Well I'm going to tell you it's one word. Now some of you don't like this word. Right? Some of us will cringe when we hear this word. What does it take? It takes write this down discipline. It takes discipline. And a groan went out across the land. I can hear you breathing, you're sighing. Oh. I was hoping it was blessing or something. it's discipline right 
Let's read uh, Proverbs 10:17. People who accept discipline are on the pathway to life, but those who ignore correction will go astray. You know, God has called each one of you to be a disciple. And I want to tell you you cannot be a true disciple without discipline. Disciple and discipline, the root word is the same. You cannot be a true disciple of Jesus Christ without discipline. Now I know some of you are saying, oh, I'm not disciplined. But some of you are very disciplined. You're very disciplined in your work. You're very disciplined in keeping your schedule. You're very disciplined in your physical workouts, in going to the gym. Some of you, uh, uh, you know, you will never miss your favorite TV show. You're disciplined. You will be there. And of course, many of us never miss a meal. We are so disciplined. So, so what am I saying? We are disciplined in some areas. So what am I saying then? We are disciplined in the things that we want to be disciplined in. We are not disciplined in what we really don't care about. But we are disciplined in what we do care about. What if you were disciplined in having your quiet morning devotional time just as you would not miss a meal? What if you were disciplined in serving others just as you would get up every day and go to work with the same discipline? What if you were disciplined in attending church on time like you would be watching your favorite TV show? We will we, we'll be disciplined in the areas we want to be disciplined. You see, there's another word for discipline. Write this down. I didn't uh, put this in your note. The other word for discipline is called habit. Habit. Right? We develop disciplines. We develop habits. Good habits. And uh, habits are simply disciplines. Actually, you are the total of all your habits combined together. Tell me what you do habitually and I'll tell you what your character is like. You habitually, you're a person who habitually tells the truth. If you habitually tell the truth, I will tell you, you're a person of integrity. If you're habitually faithful to your spouse in your marriage, I will tell you, you are a faithful person. In whatever you do over and over and over again in life without having to think about it. That's your habit. And uh, these habits become part of your life. They shape your life. They make you grow. They, 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 they control some of the things you do because you have developed good habits. And if you want to change your life, you have to change your habits. Hebrews 12.1 says this. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. You know, I want you to take your pens and circle the word weight and circle the word sin. Circle sin and weight. Right? Now those are two things. The weight, the sin that holds you back. These are two things that keeps you from doing what God uh, uh, wants you to do or being what God wants you to be. It limits your potential. What does Hebrews say? Let us strip off. Let us strip it off. Let us take it off. Take these two things off. Now everyone knows what sin is, right? You need to strip off sin. What is sin? Sin is breaking one of the commandments of God. You break a precept, a command of God that's sin. But what is a weight? You see, weight is not necessarily sin. Weight can be something that is all right. It doesn't have to be bad. It doesn't have to be sin. It takes to strip off sin and strip off weight. It's not necessarily wrong. But you know what? A weight may not be necessarily wrong, but a weight may not be necessary. 
it may not be wrong but it may not be necessary and you need to strip off the weight all kinds of things can be weight it can be a relationship you need to strip off it can be an expectation it can be an activity it could be a club that you're in it could be a, a memory that you refuse to let go it's a weight it's weighing you down it could be a fear it could be a a, a a job that you you want to do there are so many weights it will take me till tomorrow to explain how many weights because there are so many we can go through but we must let go of some things before we can put on some things so what does god want he wants your whole life what does it take to achieve what god wants it takes discipline let's look at the final question why should i do it why should i do this why should i go after my uh, people in my life who don't know christ why should i join the church family as we do this together why should i want to make the effort to grow spiritually right why should i let go of some of the things in my life to make space for god to have more room in my life i'll tell you because there are benefits for you today and there are benefits not only for you today there are benefits for you eternally but even if there were no benefits even there are benefits but even if there was no benefits here on earth at all i can tell you one reason you ought to do this and what is the answer to why should i do it because of the cross because of the cross because of what you just participated in this table today jesus gave his life completely for you and he expects your life in return he expects your life in return 2 corinthians 5:15 this is what it says he died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves instead they will live for christ who died and was raised for them he died for every one of us jesus gave his life for every one in this room some of you have believed you trusted him and you come his way some of you may have not or you may have gone back i want to tell you it's time to come home i'm hoping that even as the communion service was going and pastor general was explaining that you would have opened your heart to the lord and said lord wash me cleanse me come in i need you because what's done on the cross is done for me and now you're saying lord i want to live for you i live for you because you died for me he cares about you more than anybody else does he created you i want to tell you all the dreams you have he has a greater plan than your dreams he has a greater plan than those things that you think you want in your life you know some of you are saying you know god really spoke to me call me i i messed it up you know when i was young i know god had a call on my life but now i got married i have children now maybe grandchildren i don't know i'm going on this path and i really haven't been able to fulfill god's plan i want to tell you as you can see in our church our top priority is to let you become what god wants you to be that's why sometimes my sermons are not so nice or so flowery or so entertaining or or even so feeling good that's the word i'm looking for because i don't get up here to make you feel good i hope you feel good i hope you're blessed i hope you let me know that you're blessed i like to be encouraged but you see that's the one reason we are here as a church is to make you and us to become what god wants us to be in the short time we have when i get to heaven i am going to be blessed when i get to heaven i am going to be rejoicing when i get to heaven i am going to be walking or on air but over here i have a short time and you have a short time to accomplish what god wants to do in your life we're looking forward to what god is going to do through you romans 12:1 let's look at romans 12:1 it says this and so dear brothers and sisters i plead with you to give your bodies to god because of all he has done for you let them be a living and holy sacrifice the kind he will find acceptable this is truly the way to worship him you know it cost jesus to die for you it's going to cost you to live for him 
It cost Jesus to die for you, but it's going to cost you and me to live for him. He died on the cross, not just so I will be saved, so that everybody in my sphere of influence will have an opportunity to meet Jesus. As a pastor, I want to tell you, I preach to many people in different nations and sometimes big crowds. But you know, I can't even remember if you ask me, uh, where, where, where did you preach? How many people got saved? But if you come and talk to me, I will tell you people who are in my sphere of influence, in my world, who I had the opportunity to lead them to Jesus Christ, I will never forget them, ever. Because that's what I was made to do. That's what you were made to do. You were brought into the kingdom before your loved ones because God wants to reach your loved ones through you. That's the greatest joy that you can have. I want to tell you, lost people, those lost in your life, those lost in your world matter to God. They matter to God. It is far more important than anything else I would tell on your priority list. Nothing is more important than the people you care about and love getting to know Jesus. Listen to me. No prayer in your life is more important than the people you care about coming to know Jesus. All the money in the world you can get through a prayer. All the successes, all the positions you may accomplish, but those are not as important as you praying for the people you care about who don't know Jesus. And they coming to know Jesus. Let's stand together. Lord, I come before you today and I commit each and every one who heard this message. I pray that we will not be focused on fame, wealth or position, but we will only be focused on making an impact and an influence in this world. Give us the strength to be better people, not because of what it gives us, but what it gives others. I pray that we will not be selfish or self-centered or self-focused. I pray that our focus and our attention and our efforts always go to blessing others around us. Be with us and strengthen us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's message has touched you and you want to connect with God's family, do get in touch with us or write to us.